Thank you. These are uh, my disclosures. I think we should start um, by saying that uh, the impact of C19 um, on people with HIV is certainly multifaceted. Uh, we need to think about the direct health impacts um, of the infection and the disease, but also we need to keep in mind the uh, secondary uh, health impacts uh, related to the uh, disruption uh, of HIV prevention and treatment services uh, caused by the uh, C19 crisis. And uh, certainly we need to keep in mind that uh, many people with HIV um, are often in socially uh, disadvantaged groups uh, and therefore um, risk uh, socioeconomic disparities that um, are exacerbated by the C19 uh, crisis. So we can start by saying that um, we, we need to appreciate the fact that many people with HIV are currently experiencing significant threats uh, to their physical and mental health, to their well-being, uh, to their economic security. But let's focus now on the clinical aspect of C19 in people with HIV. Um, key recent learnings um, are that the clinical features of C19 are uh, generally the same in uh, people with and without HIV. Uh, we will review the evidence uh, that there is an increased risk of severe C19 in a subset of uh, people with HIV um, and uh, that um, this enhanced risk, this increased risk may be related to uh, parameters such as the current or nadir CD4 cell count, uh, a low CD4 CD8 ratio, uh, persistent inflammation despite um, ART, uh, and possibly um, incomplete or lack of uh, virological suppression. But certainly um, increasing age and presence of uh, comorbidities um, among people with HIV are important determinants of an increased risk of severe C19. I would like to mention earlier the studies um, in um, people with HIV looking at the uh, impact of infection and uh, the risk of severe C19 in this population. These earlier studies did not find that HIV status uh, influenced the uh, risk of severe C19. But these earlier studies have been superseded by more recent evidence from studies that have taken a different approach. These are uh, studies uh, done in the uh, USA, in the UK, and also in South Africa, all uh, coming to the conclusion by using different modalities that uh, people with HIV have about two, uh, two to threefold increased risk of um, severe outcomes um, after infection, after a diagnosis of C19. We will review in um, some details the data from the uh, ISARIC uh, cohort, but overall the magnitude of risk has been consistent in different studies. So the ISARIC uh, study um, uh, is, is a, a prospective study of uh, people hospitalized with C19. And we uh, took a snapshot of this study um, looking at the first wave of C19 and comparing uh, data from uh, 122 people with a confirmed HIV uh, positive status and uh, just over 47,000 people without HIV. Um, what was the uh, most interesting uh, difference between these two groups? Um, it was the age. We found that uh, hospitalized people uh, with HIV um, were uh, significantly younger with a median age of 56 years compared to people without HIV uh, where the median age was 74 years. Um, uh, there were also um, slightly fewer uh, females um, among uh, people with HIV, but more people of uh, black ethnicity. So looking at the presenting symptoms and observations, so this is at the time of the uh, initial presentation, we uh, saw that people with HIV had a higher uh, prevalence of fever, fatigue, uh, headache, uh, cough and dyspnea. Uh, and also um, more frequently reported, their, um, reported a sore throat. There was also slightly more frequent diarrhea among people with HIV and they were more often febrile. 
Um, however, there were no differences uh, when comparing the two groups uh, in terms of hypoxia uh, at initial presentation and also in the uh, detection of uh, chest X-ray infiltrates. Um, looking now at the comorbidities at the time of uh, presentation, uh, people with HIV, perhaps as a, a consequence, as a reflection of their uh, younger age, uh, were uh, less likely to have a chronic uh, heart disease of uh, chronically, uh, or chronic pulmonary disease, but they had more uh, frequent obesity, uh, particularly among women uh, with HIV, uh, and also more frequent moderate or severe liver disease uh, compared to people without HIV. Um, in terms of laboratory parameters, which I will not show, um, we uh, did not find an increased risk of lymphopenia. And in fact, the lymphocyte count was higher um, among people with HIV than among people without HIV. Day 28 mortality was the primary um, endpoint of the analysis. These are the uh, kaplan uh, mayer uh, curves. Overall, uh, when we looked at the total population, the um, mortality, day 28 mortality, um, was 26.7% uh, among people with HIV versus 32.1% among people with HIV. So no really uh, dramatic differences uh, uh, suggesting an increased risk among people with HIV. However, when we uh, stratified the analysis uh, based on the age group, something rather um, significant uh, became evident. Uh, in the age group below 60 years, we found that people with HIV had a substantially higher risk of mortality, of day 28 mortality, compared to people without HIV. The mortality in the age group below 60 was 21.3% among people with HIV versus 9.6% among people without HIV. We analyze uh, risk factors uh, for a day 28 mortality also in a Cox um, uh, hazard models. In the unadjusted analysis, there was no uh, difference. The um, uh, hazard ratio was 0.77 when comparing people with um, and people without HIV. However, when we adjusted for age, the relationship uh, changed um, and uh, we saw an effect of HIV status with an adjusted other ratio of 1.47, indicating uh, an increased risk of mortality among people with HIV. And as you can see, the um, overall uh, estimate of the risk did not change significantly when we um, adjusted for sex, ethnicity, and various other parameters, including 10 individual uh, comorbidities. When we restricted the adjusted analysis to the group aged below 60, then people with HIV had nearly a threefold increase in the risk of day 28 mortality. This is a, um, an analysis uh, comparing people with HIV who died within the SARIC uh, analysis um, with those who were still alive at day 28. These are only the uh, parameters that uh, show the difference between the, the two groups. And uh, overall, uh, those who died were uh, slightly older. Uh, they were more likely to have obesity or uh, diabetes. And at presentation, they were more likely to have a high uh, glucose and also increased uh, CRP. And of course, uh, the group who died was uh, more likely um, to require um, admission into intensive care and ventilation. But we have a, a more a complete set of data about the characteristic of people who died with C19 in England, looking at data presented um, from Public Health England very recently. They analyzed 99 uh, people who died um, uh, with HIV in England during the first wave. And as you can see, the median age was 60 years, 68% were of non-white ethnicity. Uh, HIV uh, infection was well established and the majority uh, was engaged with care, was on antiretroviral therapy. 58% had a, a CD4 count uh, below 350 uh, recorded in the uh, previous year, but uh, the vast majority, um, as you can see, had a suppressed uh, viral load. 90% um, had at least one comorbidity. 
We have also started to see some data um, on the immunological parameters um, in people with HIV uh, in relation to SARS-CoV-2 infection, which will help us understand the determinants of the increased risk of severe C19 uh, in a subset of people with HIV. We suspect it is the immunity, um, the persistence of inflammation, and indeed we see uh, data uh, suggesting that this may well be the case. This is a study uh, comparing 47 people with HIV with 35 without HIV, uh, five to seven months after uh, an infection with SARS-CoV-2. Um, as you can see, uh, this population was uh, virologically suppressed uh, and had a good CD4 count. Overall, um, antibody titles, uh, titers, including uh, neutralizing antibody titers and uh, T cell responses measured in interferon gamma Ellis spot assays. Um, so these were overall similar in the two groups. However, um, there was evidence that uh, a subset of people with HIV had uh, reduced uh, T cell responses. And this was the subset with a low CD4, CD8 ratio, and the subset with uh, a smaller uh, CD4 uh, T cell naive pool. There are uh, many uh, clinical uncertainties that remain. We need to understand better how the past and the current immune status, biological control, um, art history, uh, inflammation indices modulate the risk of severe C19. And this data will help us uh, to provide better counseling and better care for our patients. We need to um, uh, increase understanding of the clinical significance of the C19 induced lymphopenia that we frequently see in hospitalized patients with um, C19. And also we need to describe the uh, known mortality outcomes, including the incidence and the features of the long C19. So the um, persistent uh, symptoms, uh, signs um, following the resolution of the acute phase of the infection uh, that are uh, uh, currently being described in other populations. We need to understand the potential for uh, SARS-CoV-2 immune escape uh, in the context of significant immunocompromise. And of course, we need to um, understand uptake, safety, and efficacy of different SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in uh, people with HIV. In the meantime, where should be our um, management focus is on managing C19 and managing HIV. In terms of managing C19, this should be managed in people with HIV as we do in people without HIV. Uh, HIV is not a reason to exclude patients from uh, interventions that would be otherwise indicated. Um, of course, it's important uh, to consider alternative diagnosis to C19 or, in fact, also concomitant diagnosis such as PCP. Um, and if patients with C19 are hospitalized, uh, then we should ensure that ART is continued. We should review concomitant medications and consider potential drug-drug interactions. How to address um, SARS-CoV-2 related risks uh, among people with HIV. We need to uh, ensure uh, virological control. Um, there is no need, no recommendation to modify the ART regimen to either reduce the risk of infection or reduce the risk of severe outcomes uh, in people with HIV. It's paramount uh, to um, review, uh, diagnose and manage control comorbidities, uh, focus on obesity, diabetes, and other comorbidities. And of course, we need to prioritize uh, patients for vaccination and uh, offer appropriate counseling to our patients. And this is appropriate counseling on the risk of C19, on things that can be done to uh, manage and reduce the risk, and also on the uh, benefits and um, also remaining uncertainties about uh, vaccines against the C19 uh, in this population. And if I may uh, end uh, uh, as I started as clinicians, let's also uh, keep in mind uh, that uh, many people with HIV are feeling especially uh, vulnerable and are especially vulnerable to the economic and social impact uh, of the pandemic. Thank you.